Okay, thanks. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We are now in our fourth session in the Careers for History Majors series, 2024. I'm very, very grateful to Adam Dean for joining us today uh, to talk about the National Park Service. Um, Adam is a park ranger in education and interpretation at Valles Caldera. Um, National Preserve in New Mexico. And we'll see there, uh, I don't know if everybody saw that just a second ago, but uh, Adam showed us the, the snow outside. So uh, I, well, I guess some folks here are up in the, in the mountains in uh, Arrowhead, Lake Arrowhead and Big Bear. So they've got, they've got some snow, but um, another world in the mountains of New Mexico. Um, thanks so much. Please join me in giving a warm welcome and a great thank you to Adam for joining us today. Great. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to uh, be here. So I'm going to talk a lot about jobs for historians and careers for historians in the National Park Service. But I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the place I work at and some of the challenges of land management, public history, and interpretation that go on at national parks. So Valles Caldera National Preserve is in the Jemez Mountains. And for those of you who speak Spanish, you'll immediately pick up, I didn't say Jemez. And that's because it was a Spanish word for an indigenous name that is Hamish. And so a lot of the locals say, Hamas, or Hamas Mountains, Hamas Pueblo, and the Hamish people. And it's a relatively new national park site created by Congress in 2015. And even though I wrote a book about the establishment of national parks in the 19th century, I had no idea about the difference between a national park and a national preserve. And the main difference, and you all may laugh at this, is we allow hunting, and most national park sites do not. Oh, I think we did lose, um, and hopefully we'll hop back on. <laughs> um, there he is connected to audio again. All right, a little technical difficulty, par for the course. Everybody just sit tight. Okay. Okay, surrounded by high elevation peaks. So these big valleys, high elevation peaks, we have mixed conifer forests and ponderosa pine forests. So a lot of people, when they think of New Mexico, think of deserts, but we're really kind of a high mountain environment. Now, when it was created in 2015, a lot of the proponents said that Valles Caldera was this pristine wilderness. But unfortunately, in a lot of ways, that really wasn't the case. This land has seen extreme exploitation and resource destruction since it was first inhabited by or taken over by Hispanic farmers in 1876 and later by Anglo farmers in the 20th century. So one of those main problems is wildfire from fire suppression, overgrazing, overlogging and climate change. And it really affects everything that we do and all park employees. So, for example, even as a historian working in public interpretation, I do have to get my red card as a wildland firefighter, which I'm doing this spring. Sorry to interrupt, Adam. Do you, um, do you want to share screen from your end or should I go ahead and do it here? Do you think that might have interrupted your connection there? Um. Yeah, I 
was sharing my screen and I guess it cut out. So yeah, I think it cut out. Do you want me to go ahead and share? Or do you want to try that again? Um, how about you go ahead and share it? Yeah, I'll do that. And then you tell me when to advance. Okay. So we're on number four right now. This is the uh, challenges and joys of teaching and doing things yeah. online. So as I was saying, there's some really significant environmental challenges here related to wildfire that is really caused by a century of poor decision-making and of course, climate change. Our wetlands and streams were in poor shape from overgrazing. There's livestock fence and stockyards that, stock tanks, excuse me, that were inhibiting wildlife movement and disrupting the hydrology. And a crazy thing is there are 89,000 acres, which is a lot of land, but definitely not as big as Yellowstone. And there were a thousand miles of poorly constructed logging roads in just 89,000 acres. Like many areas throughout the American West, including California, of course, where you all are, the top predators were eradicated from bias caldera, most notably the Mexican gray wolf and the grizzly bear. Something I work with a lot is with public interpretation of with the Hamas Pueblo getting their stories, history, and ecological knowledge that they want shared with the public. And there's a long legacy of colonization here. So Valles Caldera has 38 tribal affiliations, with the most prominent being Puebloan, specifically Hamish people, Santa Clara and Cochiti, but also Navajo, Rodine, and Apache land. And there's long-standing access issues to traditional and spiritual lands that occurred both during the ranching history and still exist today as federal land. And another one of our challenges is conflict between tribal nations on use including traditional cultural practices and historical claims. To give you one example, the Hamas Pueblo owns the top of the tallest peak in our park, Redondo Peak. There's an ancient shrine there that they've been going to the top to for worship and ceremony since about 1100 AD or CE. That peak is also claimed as religiously significant by the Navajo or DNA, which has led to some conflict. So if you go to the next slide, number five, a lot of times the public thinks of national parks as untouched wilderness, and it's really not true. So humans have occupied the Hamas Mountains for 21,000 years at least. And in, the, in that really ancient period, it was a site for quarrying obsidian, which was used both for tools and weapons, but also trade. And obsidian from Valles Caldera that can be traced to here has been found in Tenochtitlan, which was the ancient Aztec capital. So go to the next slide. So this sequence shows the resource exploitation on Cerro Celebrillo. So in 1963, it still had quite a bit of old growth forest. It was clear cut logged in the late 60s, early 1970s. And when the secondary forest regrew, it regrew far denser in the previous old growth forest, which contributed significantly to massive wildfire. So if you go to the next slide. So 
our most famous or infamous fire here was the Lost Conscious fire in June of 2011. It was the largest wildfire on record in New Mexico, surpassing another one that happened near the park, Cerro Grande, in 2000. 156,000 acres burned, much of it in the park. And according to our forest ecologists, it may take 300 to 400 years for the forest to fully return. So go to the next slide. Another challenge, as I was mentioning, was overgrazing. So this is a sheep herd on Habamillo Creek in 1935. And you can see from the overgrazing stream shed erosion, the river is widened and has become very silty, all of which make it difficult for aquatic life. And so one of our successes has actually been in watershed restoration. So if you go to the next slide. That's the same location on Hopper Mill Creek today. So you can go to the next slide. So speaking, what I'm actually here to talk about, about the National Park Service and jobs for you all. There are 469 national park units with the Amashi National Historic Site designated just a few months ago, and that's in Colorado and was an internment for Japanese American citizens during World War II. National parks have every type of ecosystem from tropical rainforests to high montane grasslands, that's us, that's those meadows with big mountains, to Arctic tundra in Northern Alaska. There's also historical and cultural sites. So many people, you know, they think of battlefields like Gettysburg or Pearl Harbor, but there's also historic homes and just generic historic sites. So if you look at number 11, even though I was trained in 19th century US and environmental history, I didn't even know this existed. So does anyone know what this National Park Service site is? And to give you a hint, it is the former home of a 19th century American president who did not speak English as his first language. I think I know, but it's because I grew up around the corner. And that's cheating. Anybody else want to guess? I think the hint is in his name. Is that right? Yep. He has a very Dutch name. Yeah, I think it's that's that's Van Buren's family home in uh, Kinderhook, right? Yep. This is the Martin, if you move to the next slide. I grew up about- Martin Van Buren National Historic Site. A MPS property. I just did a online training with them. And when I meet with national park rangers and interpreters and resource professionals throughout the country, every park is unique, right? So if you're at the most recently created internment camp park versus Yellowstone versus Ulysses S. Grant's tomb, which is in the middle of New York City, right? There's a lot of different challenges and a very different work experience, right? So to move to the next slide, and thinking about jobs in the National Park Service for historians, there are jobs directly in history. The title is historian. And I sent Professor Murray these slides. And if you click that he can share with you all, if you click on that link, it will give you a much further description. So 
what you need to know is there's these different grades in the federal government, and it can really seem like its own language. But GS5 is where a lot of people start. So it does require a college degree. GS5 physicians, most of them do. And for a historian, you have to have a BA in history. But as you move up in grade, which is supposed to move up in rank, and you move up in pay, it does require either more education or more years of service. So if you have, and this is interesting, and not a lot of people know it, if you have above a 3.5 GPA in college, you can apply for a GS7 position, which otherwise you would need a master's or one year of GS5 experience. Then there's GS9, which does require a master's, a GS11, which requires a PhD, or one year at the GS9 level. So if you're thinking you need a PhD for a GS11, you actually don't. You do need to, though, to move up the ranks from five to seven to nine and get that experience year by year. Once you start getting into the 12 and above, that's where you're not just a historian, but you're supervising other historians. And the top rank is GS14, which is really reserved for high level military policy work for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You can go ahead to the next slide. But there's many other jobs in the National Park Service for historians. So uh, my title, even though I do some history, is not technically a historian. I work in interpretation, education, and public information. And there's a whole host of jobs here. Park guide is, is entry level, and you'll be working in visitor centers a lot interacting with guests, telling them about the park, policies, staying safe, you know, how to stay safe in bear terrain, all that stuff. And as you move up, you start doing programs. So programs are educational sessions for K through 12 on up, you know, college and university too, and general public. So if you're an education technician or an education specialist, that often means you're focusing on K through 12 programs in addition to interacting with visitors. The Interpretive Park Ranger series is really geared more towards public rather than K through 12. And then the supervisory position for those is the public information officer or leader of interpretation. I also wanted to bring up a law enforcement ranger because someone I work with actually has a master's in history. He started off as an interpretive ranger at Chickamauga National Battlefield Park, and then he switched to being a law enforcement ranger and moved out to Northern New Mexico. So you can move around in the National Park Service quite a bit. Obviously, there's some things like if you want to become a grizzly bear biologist, you need an educational background in grizzly bears. But for a lot of things, there's um, Adam, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, oh, yep, there. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, get back in. Right. There we go. Uh, check, check, Adam. Can you hear me? I don't think I have audio yet for you. Check. Check. Yes, there you are. Um, Adam, okay. 
Do you want to try this this until the end of the video to mute your video and then uh, and then just talk over the slides? That may uh, make it a slightly stronger connection. Got it. All right. Great. So. Go to the next slide. One of the most. On. Are we back on. Yes, I can hear you now. So moving to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, the one before then. Whoa, there we go. One of the most common questions I get is, from just ordinary visitors is how do you get a job with the National Park Service? And any type of experience you have with the NPS before you apply helps you tremendously. So that experience can happen through volunteering which is as simple as contacting a local MPS site. It can also happen through internships. There's lots of internship programs through that are affiliated with the National Park Service. For example, there's an ancestral lands program for indigenous college students. And we had a intern from that program at our park this last summer. There's also something called the Pathways Program, which the MPS uses for both current students, recent graduates, and even recent graduate school graduates. I'd say the most common way, though, is seasonal employment. So that is working as a seasonal employee in the National Park Service, which is roughly a six-month stint. And four seasons in a five-year window give you the ability to apply for what the National Park Service calls career positions that would otherwise not be open to the public. And that's a really great way to make these, frankly, competitive jobs a little bit less competitive to get into. Can you move to the next slide? So here's some generic advice that I think is really valuable. The first two I would classify as being patient. So unfortunately, a lot of people get turned off from applying for national park jobs because of the USA Jobs website. And so if you go in with the mindset that, yeah, I'm going to be swearing a little bit, it's not the easiest to navigate, but I'm going to get through it, that's step one. Step two, and I'm really not the biggest fan of these things, but it's what you have to do. Most jobs have these tests associated with them that are somewhat similar to the LSAT or the SAT. The LSAT's the law school exam. They're not really things you can study for, but again, you need to adopt the attitude that, hey, this is unfortunately going to take two to three hours of my time. I'm going to sit down with pen and paper and do my best. And a lot of people just stop when they see the tests instead of going through the process. Number three, hopefully shouldn't come as a surprise, but are we back? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Western national parks are super popular. 
Um, one of my coworkers used to be a seasonal at Yosemite, and she said there were 350 applications for 20 seasonal jobs, and the Park Service capped it at 350. So there probably would have been twice or three times that versus applying to, no offense to Martin Van Buren, but the Martin Van Buren National Historic Site would be less competitive. And of course, what a lot of people do is they'll apply to the lesser known parks. And as they get experience, they'll switch to the park they really want to be at. Resumes in the National Park Service are interesting. You find this funny, um, Jeremy. They're very similar to academic CVs. So even as a recent college graduate, you should be thinking two to three pages and very detailed. And I should also mention that I absolutely love my job as a park ranger. I was a college professor for 10 years prior to it. But one of the main challenges at almost any park is park housing. So for example, if you really want to work at Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, the nearest city is Jackson Hole, where Matthew McConaughey has a summer home and billionaires are pushing out the millionaires who own property there. So parks have tried to address this by building their own housing units, but even that has been a challenge. Yellowstone, for example, got a $40 million private donation to build new park housing. And it's not to say it can't be overcome. You know, I live in a very expensive area um, here in northern New Mexico, but if you're a ranger at Grand Teton and you think you're going to live in Jackson Hole, I'm sorry, but you're not. You're going to be living in park housing, right? This is great. I um... So I um, wanted to hopefully turn my camera back on and see if that works. And then take some questions and have a discussion about any of the topics I presented on. This is so great. Adam, I want to ask you a sort of housekeeping question first, and that is, are you comfortable with me sharing that slideshow, or would you rather just have me share the links on it? Yep, share the entire slideshow. Thank you so much. That's really great. So everybody who's here, if you received the announcement about this event by email, you will also follow up on the same email threads with the slideshow that, that includes embedded all of these terrific links. I was opening them as we went, just in case. But well, first of all, please join me in giving a thank you to Adam, uh, Adam for joining us today. Um, and I realized later that the same noise suppression that Bashara was talking about also suppresses applause. I don't know if you noticed that, but there were, there were uh, uh, eight of us here applauding and uh, and and as well as everybody applauding on online. But thank you, thank you, Adam, um, for for joining us, Professor Dean. I should say, I, I uh, um, it, this is this has been so um, exciting for me. I'm going to turn the light on here, and we have a question already, uh, Randy. Yeah, um, well, this is just kind of a stupid question. But right at the start, your opening photograph, it said it was by D. Unser. And I was wondering if that's by from the famous Unser family of Albuquerque. Did we lose Adam? Check, check. Yeah. The, the question struck him as done. Do you want to go back to the first question? This one here. Yeah. Adam, can you hear us? I don't have um, a for you. Oh, there you are. You're back. Yep. I uh, heard the question. I don't actually know the answer. That was from our photo archive. So I just gave the photo credit, but no idea um, who the, the person is who took the photo. 
Beautiful picture. Beautiful picture. Um, this is I, this has been so so comprehensive, Adam. I I learned so much, and I got so much wonderful information. Really, de you you mentioned the the CV being detailed. The students should make. Um, that's just one detail in such a really I think empowering batch of information for somebody who wants to go into this application process. Um, you gave us the, the big picture, but you also gave us, uh, um, gave, gave the students here, um, gave me actually, I'm looking at this as, as an offer. This, this looks really cool, but, but understanding how that application process takes place so clearly. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Randy, another question. Um, so, so many of the national parks are nature of national parks uh how hard is it to get into one of the actual historical national parks one of the battlefield national parks for example it depends and i just wanted to say even though we are a nature park we're also a history park so we have the tremendous archaeology in fact large parts of the park are we can't share all the rich archaeology there we have the highest elevation agriculture at our park that's been discovered in North America. And I use discovered in quotes because when I speak to my friends at Hamish Pueblo, they're like, yeah, that was Hamish agriculture. So we are both a nature park and a historic and culture park. But to answer your question, it really depends. So Gettysburg's very popular. The Civil War battle sites fields are hard to get. Um, but the lesser well-known historic sites are easier to get a job. So our uh, Martin Van Buren historic site. <laughs> um, you know, some of the lesser known presidents have these historic homes and sites that are easier to get into. There's a crazy one. Um, I think in Penn, I think it's the smallest national park site. It's just a. Um, it's related to a Hungarian revolutionary who toured the U.S. in the 1840s. Very specific. <laughs> Very specific. So yeah, that would be easy, much easier to get a job at than Yellowstone. And, you know, we're fairly close to Los Alamos. So we have the Manhattan Project National Historic Site, which is a very, very different kind of park than the one I work at. Thanks. And, and so I should have added that if you have veteran. Whoop. Lost you there. Hold on just a second. Check, check. Let's see. Check, check. Are we back? There we are. Can you hear me? Sorry, I don't have audio for you yet. Check, check. Are we on? There we are. We're back. Okay. If you are a veteran or served in the Peace Corps, that does give you a leg up in the process. Um, Kelsey, please, question. I yeah, just curious, I'm um, mentioning archaeologists in national parks too. Do they follow the GS tier with historians or is that a separate, do they have separate tiers, I guess? That's a really good question. In fact, all jobs really follow those GS tiers. Check, check. I think we're... Frozen. Check, check. Yeah, I'm back. back. All right. I'll have to turn off my camera, even though I don't like it. <laughs> um, yes, archaeology is similar, and there's, in, I would, especially here in New Mexico, there's a lot of jobs in archaeology. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Chelsea, for that question. Um, anybody else questions? Um, so you mentioned that the, the academic CV as opposed to the resume. Um, so they're, they're looking for 
historians as historians doing historian things. Publishing, for example, a lot of these students will be will will have student publications and student journals um, to their name, uh, language experience, those the, the, those kind of things. And then, are you would you be looking for descriptions of duties at different different jobs as well? Can you tell us a little bit more about the CV resume? Yeah, right there? so. I would definitely list your publications as student publications. And when you are describing jobs, I would not describe job duties, but mm -hmm. instead, so you don't want a job description, you want your accomplishments, right? So Jeremy, I was a department chair, so I wouldn't list department chair, course scheduling, um, you know, teaching evaluations, you know, I said, led successful program and that met accreditation approval, scheduled, you know, six, you know, 45 classes, conducted teaching about, you know, performed teaching evaluations for X amount of professors, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to use a lot of action words to describe what you do. And I'm glad you brought up languages because that actually gets you points in the National Park Service screening process. Mm -hmm. So I half decently speak two other languages, um, Spanish and Finnish, and had documented language tests for each. And while Finnish is close to useless in northern New Mexico, it nevertheless, you know, helps your overall application. Spanish, of course, being of much higher value here. That's great. Um, are there other specific skills um, that you think would set you? You mentioned the, the screening process. Are there other things that just to kind of reverse engineer your perfect job applicant? Um, are there other things that that um, students should be aspiring to have on their CV, on their accomplishments by the time they show up for for applications? Yeah, so we were having an interesting conversation, and I promise I'm not biased as a former history professor, but um, my supervisor, who's not a history major at all, was complaining about seeing some CVs and resumes with, there's literally colleges that have national park management programs. Uh and his personal preference is actually not for those. He wants someone who's more well-rounded. So we have on my team, someone with an MFA in nature photography. We have someone who was a wildlife biologist, but is in interpretation now. And we have someone who has a PhD in anthropology. So we have a wide, array of backgrounds and degrees and you know as as i said you know if you're applying to be a wildlife biologist you need to have that degree if you're applying for a historian position you need a history degree but for a lot of the other positions i've been hearing a lot this kind of broader base Check, check, we might be. I ended at skills? Yes. Okay, good writing skills, public communication skills. You also need conflict management skills. For example, um, we did a permit for Hamish Pueblo traditional eagle catching, which is a key religious ceremony that's been done at Valles Caldera since the 1100s. And, but some of the members of the Navajo Nation are upset about that. And, you know, one of them really, <laughs> just to be honest, let me uh, have it verbally. So, you know, handling those really tough 
conflicts with um, composure is important. As I said, I, it's also flexible. So yeah, I'm using my history degrees all the time. I wrote a research report on historical presence of Check, check. Check, check. It keeps cutting out. Yep. Um, I, we all have to get wildland fire training too. And I was sent out this summer in an F-150 Lightning to go get cows out of the road. So there's a lot of different mm -hmm. um involved and that's what I love because you know every day is a little different but you you have to be prepared for those changes on a day-to-day -day basis one thing we've heard a lot in these first three sessions but I I know last year we did something similar the other duties as assigned that may be <laughs> I mean that's a kind of theme in this in this program so something like conflict resolution, the kind of flexibility and agility and communication abilities that that, that skill shows probably tells an employer that you're also able to do those other duties as assigned. Um, but that's, uh, that's something we hear a lot. Uh, does anybody in, in uh, Zoom land have any questions? I think this has been really, really thorough, Adam. Um, and and so much more, I think, to learn following those links that you provided. And I'm going to uh, share them out with everybody as well. One other thing I wanted to say is don't try to game the resume. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've seen students think that they have to get their resume past AI. So they'll throw in as many words as possible and then like make them blank, like white font on white background. Yeah, you know, huh. that 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 stuff doesn't work. That's no resume games. I think that's always uh, that's a good idea. Um, any other any other sort of disqualifiers in in terms of the things that you see and and say okay that's gonna that's gonna uh, get you in the in the wrong pile. Um, I really don't mean to sound elitist because I think there's a lot of people without college degrees that would be great park rangers. But, you know, I often get asked, you know, I want to be a park ranger, but I don't have a college degree. And unfortunately, with how competitive these are, it's not going to happen. Is that, are there other ways through, for example, to... Well, law enforcement or uh, anything else, or is it is that really just a sort of non-starter for any any uh, uh, aspect of the field? That's a good question. Um, you know, there's lots of trade schools and mechanic schools that are really valuable um, and get you into facilities management. But even on the law enforcement ranger side, yeah, it's it's a college degree. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, well, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. You're talking to the right, the right crowd on that front. Um, um, anybody else? Anybody else have any um, any questions for Adam? You make it sound really exciting, Adam. You make it sound really appealing. I, I think this is. Um, uh, do, do you mind talking a little bit about your your personal uh, um, education and then career path and then how it, how it developed into um, uh, working in the national parks? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. I went to college at UCLA, and I was a history major because that's what an uncle told me was good for law school, and that's kind of what I wanted to do. But then I had some great professors at UCLA, and they encouraged me to go to graduate school in history, which I did out in Virginia. 
And when I finished my PhD at UVA, it was in environmental history and 19th century American history. You know, the national parks and the environment have always been a huge part of my life. You know, my father and grandfather took my brother and I to the Tetons and Yellowstone literally every summer. And I worked actually for the Virginia Department of Forestry for a year. And then I got a tenure track position at a small liberal arts college in Virginia. And, and you know, I would have honestly been very content there in a lot of ways, Jeremy, but even though I had tenure and I was department chair and everything, the school's in serious danger of collapsing. <laughs> and so I first tried to stay in academia. I got an on-campus job interview at Utah State, which is um, close to where my family is. But when that didn't um, happen, you know, my family kind of decided we were going to move back. We we're going to move west um, in the Rockies to be closer to my parents and brother. And so, you know, I thought I have a passion for the National Park Service. It's been a research area. I also taught a Yellowstone study away program when I was a college professor, which was some of my most enjoyable teaching. And so I started applying for every historian or interpretive ranger position that was full time. And I got this one. Excellent. So yeah, it's been a uh, definitely a big shift for the family. I was talking about cost of living. It's tremendously more expensive here than in Southwest Virginia. And that's true of a lot of national park sites. So that is a challenge. Ever, um, it's definitely an overcomable challenge. But again, if you're heading into Grand Teton thinking you're going to live in Jackson Hole, you're not. That's, yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, I guess if you think of the, the, the most spectacular places in the, on the planet, in the country, the most physically beautiful places to, to be, you can imagine that, that it must be tricky to get a, get a place. Uh, Ezekiel, please. Yeah, um, how much more competitive you would say it is to get into the, like, Western United States National Parks than, like, the ones in the eastern side on the East Coast? It frankly is more competitive. I mean, there's a few exceptions, like Smoke, Great Smoky Mountains, pretty competitive. That's a big eastern park. But everyone wants to work at Yellowstone, um, Yosemite, Grand Teton. Um, you, you know, Vias Caldera is pretty competitive as well, to be honest, but it's not as competitive as Yellowstone simply because of the name recognition. It's not not doable. I mean, my coworker, um, Melanie Portillo, she graduated just two years ago, was a seasonal at Yosemite and, you know, has a full time job on the same team that I work on. Kelsey, please. Um, so just curious, because I encountered this in a couple other professions where like having an MA sort of disadvantages you on in terms of like pay scale preference. So would you say it's more advantageous to come in as like an entry level candidate with an MA or do they prefer BAs or even PhD? How does, how does that work in terms of getting in and to begin with? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'd say 90% of the people on my team have either an MA or a PhD. Um, I don't think it ever disadvantages you to have those degrees, but I also think it's not true that it, you, there's lots of people in supervisory positions who only have I shouldn't say only, who just have a BA or a BS. Yeah, that is a tricky thing that comes up sometimes with teaching work as well. Um, the sequence of the credentials to the MA, do you want to be, how do you want to go on the market in terms of uh, 
the pay scale that you start at. So that's a tricky, but but you would say don't don't hold back in terms of um, waiting to get the MA until after you've secured a position or something like that. Security. Yeah, and a lot of people combine them. So um, two of the people, one of whom I mentioned, was working on their MA while doing seasonal work. So, you know, you do the MA during the academic calendar, then get a seasonal position in the summer with the National Park Service so that you're Yeah. I lost audio there. Check. Are we back? Yep. All right. There we are. There we are. Thank you. And the other thing is you can combine the two working as a seasonal employee while getting your MA. Right. Um, is there any, do you think there's any possibility that somebody would look at a candidate with an MA or, or get any kind of guidance in the hiring process that said, focus on the entry level BA student because you don't have a mandate to hire students at that other pace, to hire incoming people at that other pay scale. Is that a possibility or, or is that not at all an issue? I don't think so. I really don't. Um, and they do have the specific pathways for re I think we might have lost you again there. Check, check. All right, just wanted to say they have the, no, I don't think there would be a scenario like that. Um, of course, each hiring manager is different, so I can't say, you know, 100%, but, you know, 90%, I don't think that would happen. Yeah. And then you have the specific pathways for recent MAs and PhDs. Okay. All right. Um, well, we're getting to the bottom of the hour. Um, one more quick round if anybody has any questions. Um Chelsea said, thank you in the chat. Thanks, Chelsea, for your questions. Um, I do want to move toward wrapping up this portion. Um, Adam, I'll give you a chance if you have any, any closing thoughts, but I just want to thank you so much. Uh, we had a couple of hiccups with the audio, but everything you're saying came through loud and clear. And, clear. and, uh, and we, could, we could hear you with all this terrific information. Um, I'm also great. grateful that, that we can share the, the, the slideshow because it has all those great links and guidance in terms of the application process. So thank you, thank you so much. And Jeremy, you have my email, but I just typed in my email. Feel free to ask me specific questions. Also happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting if you want to talk about something or bounce an idea. That's awesome, yes, I, I will. Thank you, thank you so much, Adam. And thanks, Kate, for joining us. Kate's gonna join us from UC Press um, in a few weeks uh, down the road. Awesome. I appreciate you joining as well, Kate. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Adam. I have your your uh, email address, and you, uh, Adam just dropped his email address in the chat there for everybody. Um, but I will uh, I will certainly follow up with you um, and send along a book from our our uh, our wonderful faculty. Um, awesome. So you'll get uh, Diana Johnson's book uh, as a, as a small gesture of thanks for your really wonderful presentation here today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. I'll follow up with you. All right. Have a good evening. Take care. You too.